Today we are going to talk about p-values, which are one of the more important concepts that you'll talk about in STAT 3202. So you really want to understand, maybe watch this lecture twice to make sure you know exactly what's going on here. Okay, so please complete this lecture check before Friday, April 10th at 11.59. So first, we got to talk about the definition of a p-value. This is something you need to absolutely know from here on out in every stat class you take subsequently. So a p-value is the probability of observing data as or more favorable to the alternative hypothesis as what was actually observed, assuming the null hypothesis is true. That's kind of a convoluted definition, and if you Google it, you'll probably find definitions that are worded slightly differently. You know, there's more than one way to say that. But the main thing that you'll find in any definition of a p-value is there's three main parts to it. So make sure you know what this definition is and never forget it because if you're gonna do anything with statistics or data science from here on out, you need to know what a p-value is. So let's talk about what a p-value is in the context of an example we've already seen, which is where the Cleveland Browns had 11 coin tosses. But let's suppose for the sake of this example that they actually did win one. So we took 11 coin tosses and we won one of them. And our goal is to test a null hypothesis that the true probability you win is equal to 50% versus, oops, that should be an alternative. Let me fix that real quick for you. Versus the alternative hypothesis that P is less than 50% at a significance level 0.01. And rather than pick the rejection region like we've done up to this point, let's use a p-value to test this hypothesis because we use p-values to test hypotheses. So what we need to do then is think back to our definition that we just saw, compute the probability of observing data as or more favorable to the alternative hypothesis as what was observed assuming the null hypothesis is true. And I've color coded the definition here because these are the three main parts of any p-value definition you'll find in any textbook or any website or something. So the green, the red, and the purple parts, we're gonna break these down one at a time and address all three parts of the p-value definition. So the easiest part, I think, for this problem is assuming the null hypothesis is true. Any definition of a p-value you find will have some little clause in it about assuming the null hypothesis is true. So the way we do that in this problem is we assume P is 50%. Now we did that anyway when we did, when we did hypothesis testing previously and computed the rejection. Um, we computed an observed statistic and looked to see if it was in the rejection region. So assuming that all hypothesis is true is not any different than the hypothesis testing framework we've seen so far. So this hopefully isn't too jarring to or too new for you to assume that the null is true. So in this case, what that means for us is we're going to assume that P actually is 50% and see what happens as a result of that assumption. So this to remind you, these are the, this is the hypothesis we're testing and I have that wrong again there with the H A with a significance level of 0.01. And so this is to remind you then what the definition is that we want to test. And so we figured out that assuming that all hypothesis is true, the purple part means I need to assume that P is 50%. What about the red part? What is as or more favorable to the alternative hypothesis as what was observed? It's kind of a complicated sentence and let's break that down. So as or more favorable to the alternative hypothesis. So the alternative is that the probability is less than 50% in this case. So we have to look to the alternative here to decipher the red part of the definition. And so what would be, fa what would be favorable to the alternative hypothesis if the alternative is the probability is less than 50% then favorable to the alternative hypothesis means we are winning few coin tosses, means we are observing a few number of, a, a small number I should say, of coin tosses that would actually won. So what is as favorable to the alternative hypothesis as what we observed is we win one coin toss. That's what we actually observed, and that seems to support the alternative, right? But we also need to consider the scenario where we win zero coin tosses, because that is actually more favorable to the alternative as what we observed. If we win zero coin tosses, doesn't that seem to provide evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis? It does, and in fact, it provides stronger evidence in favor of the alternative than what we actually observed. So we need to, the red part of this definition means I need to consider 
two cases here. We win either zero or one coin toss because those represent the scenarios that are as favorable or more favorable to the alternative as what we actually observed, which was one is what we actually observed. So to remind you, there's the hypotheses again, and yet again, I'll fix that HA. There's the hypotheses as a reminder, there's the definition as a reminder. And so we need to then compute the probability of observing zero or one coin toss win, assuming P is 50%. So that's how I've translated then. The second bullet point is the generic general definition of a P value. I've translated that into what it means for this particular problem. I need to compute the probability that we observe either zero or one win of a coin toss, assuming the truth really is 50%. And that's a problem we can solve. So how do we compute this probability? Well, the probability you win one coin toss, think back to how we did probabilities with binomial context. I'm sure you saw this in a previous stat class. It's 11 choose one, 0.5 to the 10th power because we lose 10 with 50% probability and then 0.5 to the first power because we win one with 50% probability. And then the 11 choose one out in front of that, remember there are 11 ways we could have won one coin toss. We might have won the sixth or we might have won the 10th. There's 11 ways that that could happen. And if you do the arithmetic there, you get about 0 0.00537 is the probability that you win one coin toss, exactly one, assuming the probability is 50%. Now we also have to remember the red part of that definition is that we also need to consider the scenario that is more favorable to the alternative hypothesis, which means we also need to consider the context where we win zero coin tosses, which is 11 to zero. 50% to the 11th power, 50% to the 0th power. If you do the arithmetic, that turns out to be a very small number, 0 0.000488. So then combine those together to get the probability that you either win 0 or 1. That's the sum of those two. And you get 0 0.005859. That is the p-value because that is the probability that we observe data as or more favorable to the alternative hypothesis, assuming the null is true. All of those calculations were undertaken with the assumption that P was 50%, that's the purple part of the definition. We considered the cases that were as or more favorable than our actual obs observation of one win, that's why we had the zero and one wins, and then we computed the probability of that event happening, zero or one, and added them together. So this number represents our p-value then. So the p-value in this problem then is 0 0.005859. What does that mean? So that means if p really is 50%, then there's just a 0.5859% chance that we would have observed the data we actually observed, i.e. winning one coin toss only, or more extreme. So what does that mean then? Well, under the assumption we made that p is 50%, we observed some data that do not seem very realistic we observe data that have a very small chance of happening. So one of two things might have happened. Number one, our assumption was wrong. We made the wrong assumption because the assumption we made about P being 50% led to a very small probability, meaning we reject our null. But what's the other possibility? We might have just gotten really unlucky, right? And in that case, that would mean we committed a type one error, like we've talked about before. There is a 0.5859% chance that we really do win zero or one coin tosses out of 11, assuming the probability is really 50%. It's not impossible, so there is a possibility that we made a mistake and made a type one error. Reject the null is our uh, conclusion here. Um, again, the probability that we made a type one error is 5%, because that was my alpha level. Or I'm sorry, I compared alpha 1% is what I had before. So there is a 1% chance, assuming the null is true, we did make a type one error. Um, so what do you do with the p-value then? Is that 0.5859 unrealistic enough? Well, yes, because that's what we set the alpha level for. You choose an alpha level before you compute the p-value, and that tells you how low your p-value needs to be for you to consider it unreasonable. So because we pre-specified alpha to be 1%, then observing that p-value of 0.005859 means that's so unrealistic, we're willing to reject our null hypothesis. So to put it concretely, if your p-value is less than the alpha level you found, reject the null hypothesis. If your p-value is greater than or equal to the alpha you pre-specified, fail to reject your null. 
So you just need to compare the p-value to alpha. It's really simple. Now the danger in things that are really simple like that is that you can kind of take the process for granted um, and kind of ignore the, the drawbacks of this kind of a process. But you know, much more on that later on in your future stack courses. For now, we just want to learn how to compute them and how to interpret them. So let's look at another example then in a test on a mean. So here is the problem. Suppose it's believed that the average transmission rate for a disease from person to person is 12%. We observed 61 patients and found a transmission rate of 17%. So, and by that, I mean you either transmitted it to someone or you did not transmit it to someone. So that sounds like a Bernoulli to me, right? A yes or a no, a success or a failure. Is there evidence the transmission rate has increased? Well, if we thought it was 12% to begin with, and then we took 61 patients and found it was 17%, do we have evidence that the transmission rate has increased from what we believed it was previously, 12%? Test your hypothesis with a p-value at significance level 0.05. So the hypotheses are right in this case. The null is that nothing has changed. The null is that we have what we thought we did to begin with, p equals 12%. And the alternative then, if we're trying to find evidence that it has increased, remember that has to be my alternative. The burden of proof is on us as the researchers and the statisticians to show that the probability has increased from the 12%. So we need to make that our alternative hypothesis. And we'll choose an alpha level of 5% for the sake of this problem. So, Let's revisit our definition, the probability of observing data as or more favorable to the alternative hypothesis as what was actually observed, assuming the null is true. So let's start with the easy part here, I think, and that's always just assume the null hypothesis is true. So operate under the assumption that P really is 12%. So 0.12 is my true probability of transmitting yes or no to another person. The red part here, as or more favorable to the alternative hypothesis as what was observed. So we need to think about our sampling distribution now. What is as or more favorable to the alternative hypothesis? Well, as a reminder, remember my alternative hypothesis um, is that P is greater than 12%. So observing a higher rate of transmission is gonna be favorable. So keep in mind that that greater than sign in my alternative hypothesis means I'm gonna be looking at the greater than side or the, um, the right side of my sample distribution. So keep that in mind. And we'll jump back ahead to where we were. So I wrote the sampling distribution. Remember, if we're testing on P, I need to use my unbiased estimator P hat. And we've many times now used this sampling distribution, P hat minus P over the square root of P times one minus P over N. That is a normal zero one because of the central limit theorem, right? I have 61 patients, so we can go ahead and use the CLT here and assume that that follows a standard normal distribution. Well, I'm gonna plug in 12% for P there, right? Because I'm assuming the null hypothesis is true, as we always do when working with P values and hypothesis tests. So I can plug in 12% for P, and I can go ahead and plug in that 61 for N, right? And then that value is gonna follow a standard normal zero one. So we're still trying to answer that question then, what's as or more favorable to the alternative hypothesis? So this is just what we had on the previous slide. And then why don't we go ahead and plug in our P hat then? So 17% is my estimated probability of transmission based on the data we actually observed. Remember, we observed 17% um, is that, uh, hang on, I'm gonna pause this for a second. Okay, sorry, I thought I made a mistake. I just had to double check my math there. But yeah, okay, so where I was previously was we plug in um, 0.17 or 17% for the P hat that we observed. And so my Z observed, remember we call it Z because we already concluded that was a standard normal zero one, and we use Z for that. So my observed Z based on the 0.17 that I actually observed is gonna be, if you do the arithmetic there, 1.2017. So that's my observed Z value. And so what does as or more favorable to the alternative mean? Well, that means I, if I observe a Z statistic of greater than or equal to 1.2017, that's as or more favorable to the alternative. Um, that greater than, remember we match that with the alternative hypothesis to think about whether the left side or the right side of my sampling distribution was gonna be favorable to the alternative. And because my alternative is P greater than 0.12, then I need to look at the greater than side. So, um, you know, I, I drew lots of pictures in the first few 
in the first few lectures, but the pictures really have to be good and accurate here to illustrate the points I'm trying to make. So I made these pictures ahead of time because these are hard to draw by hand. So as we just stated, as or more favorable to the alternative means observing a Z statistic of greater than 1.207. So the picture you see here is a standard normal 01. The red dot is the observed Z statistic we actually found. So the red dot is at 1.2 on that X axis there. The black shaded region is the P value. That's the probability of observing greater than or equal to 1.2017. That's the probability of observing as or more favorable to the alternative. And you can look at that shaded part and try to estimate, well, what percentage of your bell curve of your normal 01 have you actually shaded there? Just kind of eyeballing it to get an estimate. And I encourage you to draw pictures for these problems. My guess is that's about 15% of the curve that I've shaded in. So my guess that the p-value is 15%. But we need to actually compute exactly what it is. And to do that, we use the p-norm function in R. I'm using p-norm as opposed to pt or something like that because I have a normal sampling distribution, right? So the P stands for probability. We've used Q norm for the quantiles of a normal. We've used uh, R norm to generate random normals. Now we're using P norm to compute the probability. So P norm 1.201701 lower dot tail equals false will compute the probability in a standard normal 01 that you are greater than 1.2017. So that line of code will tell you what the shaded area is in the picture that we've drawn there, which is about 11%. And so that should make sense. Does that look like about 11% of the bell curve has been shaded? Yeah, I think it does. So that seems right to me. That lower dot tail equals false is what you use when you are looking at the right side of the shaded part. Instead, if, you, um, if we had a problem where we were looking at the left side shaded, where we had a less than sign in our alternative hypothesis, then we would do lower dot tail equals true. So the p-value in this problem then is 0.115 approximately. Compare it to alpha. My alpha was 0.05 or whatever. Um, it was either 0.01 or 0.05. Either way, it's greater than alpha, the p-value. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Even though I just happened to observe 17% in my sample, that's not convincing enough evidence to reject my hypothesis that the probability is really 12%. Maybe I just got... Um, an unusual sample where more people transmitted than average. So I don't want to, as a little bit of review here, we can still compute a rejection region to test this hypothesis and it better lead to the exact same conclusion as the p-value method. So here in this picture, we still have the standard normal and sampling distribution. That red point is still at the observed statistic for my z, which was 1.2. And then the blue region is the rejection region. The blue I've calibrated to be exactly 5%. And how did we do that? Remember, this is review now. I used the Q norm, the quantile of the standard normal 01. Remember, I'm using the 95th percentile now because it tells you the left side. So that tells me that that blue rejection region begins at 1.644. That's where the blue line begins vertically. And so if that's the rejection region and my red Z observed is not inside that, right? So because my observed Z of 1.2017 is below the rejection region, I fail to reject the null hypothesis. So I better get the exact same conclusion. If I'm using the same alpha in both tests, you should get the exact same conclusion both times. So this slide here, remember, is just review of what we've already done. I just want to emphasize that we're getting the same result with the p-value as we got with the rejection region. So here's another example then, uh, a variance test, which we've seen already before. Let's assume a ventilator consumes about 125 watts of electricity. If the consumption is too highly variable, the power generation system may fail. So if the variance fluctuates beyond 1600 watts squared, the power may not be able to meet demand. So assume power generation is normally distributed. Remember, that's an assumption we needed to make with the way we, we've tested on sigma squared on variance previously. So out of 17 ventilators we observe in watts, these are the amount of power consumed by each ventilator. And so that's the data that you can have and you can copy that and plug that into R. But um, this is the same text we had before, just to remind you the problem. Here's the hypotheses we wanna test. A null hypothesis that the variance is 1600 watts squared versus an alternative that the variance is greater than 1600. We do not want to reject the null here, right? Because if we conclude the variance is greater than 1600 watts squared, then we're going to have problems generating the power because it's too variable. Let's choose an alpha level of 0.05 for this problem. Okay, so 
what do we have to do then? Remember, for the p-value, we need the probability of observing data as or more favorable to the alternative as what was observed, assuming the null is true. So when we did tests on the variance, remember, we used n minus 1 times s squared over sigma squared to follow a chi-square n minus 1 distribution. In this problem, I can plug in everything for that. We had a sample size of 17 as n. You can compute s squared and r with that vector of data I provided on the previous slide. It turns out to be 2,663 watts squared is the value you get for that. And then that 1,600, remember the purple part of our definition, assuming the null is true. So the null was that the variance is equal to 1,600, so that's what I plug in for the sigma squared. So if you do the arithmetic, you observed a chi-square statistic of 26.63971. Um, that's your observed chi-square. So in the picture, that's where that red dot is plotted at 26.6. And so the p-value begins there. Everything greater than that, because remember my alternative is that the variance is greater than 1600. So I look at the right-sided shaded to be the p-value. That black shaded part is the p-value. You can get an estimate by looking at that. It looks like it's about 7 or 8%, I would guess, of that chi-square 16 distribution that's plotted there. Um, how do we actually compute the p-value? We need to find the probability of observing a chi-square 16 as or more extreme than 26.639. And so we do that with the p-chi-square function, the probability of observing a chi-square greater than 26.639 with 16 degrees of freedom. Again, we use the argument lower dot tail equals false to get the right-sided portion of that. And it turns out, that turns out to be 0.0456. So that's just barely below the alpha threshold that we chose previously of 0.05. So it turns out in this case, we reject our null hypothesis because my p-value, the probability of observing a chi-square 16 of greater than or equal to 26.6 turned out to be small. So remember our conclusion is, well, my assumption must have been unreasonable because I observed some very unreasonable data. So one thing I want to point out here before we look at the next slide is that my p-value is just barely below the threshold, right? It's just a little bit below the 0.05. So I just, um, I almost didn't reject it, but I did reject it in this case. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, well, just like I said, we reject the null. How did we do this previously? So this slide is completely review we could compute a rejection region. So the blue shaded portion, that was exactly 5%. Where did we find where that rejection region began? By using the Q, the quantile of a chi-square, the 95th percentile with 16 degrees of freedom tells you that the rejection region begins at 26.30. Now remember our observed chi-square was 26.63. That was the N minus one S squared over sigma squared. And it is greater than the rejection region. So we do reject the null, right? But look here, isn't it just barely in the rejection region? Just like in the previous slide, my p-value was just barely less than alpha, so I rejected. And here, my observed chi-square is just barely in the rejection region, so I come to the same conclusion. I reject the null hypothesis. As long as my alpha was the same in both of these cases, we should reach the exact same conclusion. And you can see in the picture that that little red dot of the observed chi-square is just barely in the blue rejection region. And so lastly, let's review an F-test on a ratio of variances. So from the previous data that we had before, we'll use that data again. And then let's say we have a different manufacturer who gave us 11 ventilators, and we get the following data in the number of watts used per hour. Or I guess watts is already measured in time, so the number of joules used per hour, i.e. the number of watts. So there's your data. Is there evidence that the new manufacturer will give that a subscript of N has a variability lower than that of the old manufacturer, O. So my null hypothesis is that the variance of N is equal to the variance of O, and my alternative is that the variance of N is less than the variance of O, but set alpha equal 0.01. But remember what I told you to do here for the tests on variances. It's easier to work with the test statistic and the sampling distribution if we write these hypotheses as ratios. So rather than the way I have it in the third bullet point, let's focus on the fourth bullet point. It's equivalent to say the null hypothesis that the ratio of n to o is one versus an alternative that the ratio of n to o, those variances, is less than one. So notice in this example, this is the first one we've done today where we have that less than sign in the alternative. So now we're gonna be focusing on the left side of my sampling distribution.
So as we learned in previously with these F tests, if I just take the ratio of the S squareds, the ratio of the sample variances from two populations A and B, that follows an F distribution. And so in this case, that means that you can do the math in R and compute the variances of the two samples, new and old, new in the numerator, old in the denominator, and you get 1043 watts squared over 2663 watts squared as your sample variances. Under my null hypothesis assumption, that's gonna follow an F1016. So I have the F1016 plotted in the plot there. And so that red dot, if you actually compute that arithmetic there, you get 0.3916 as your observed F statistic. So that's where the red dot is plotted on the F. Now a common mistake will be for people to stop here because 0.39 kind of looks like a probability, right? That's your F statistic. You still have to translate that into a probability. The p-value is not 0.39. That's just the observed F value that I got. So that red dot is plotted there and then the black value shaded to the left this time, remember, because I was looking at a less than and my alternative hypothesis. So that black shaded region is the p-value here. How do I compute that? The same way I did in the previous two examples. Rather than P norm or P chi square, I'm gonna use PF this time, right? So PF of my observed 0.3916 with 10 and 16 degrees of freedom, remember the order matters there. 10 is the numerator, 16 is the denominator degrees of freedom. Lower dot tail, this time equals true because I want the left side or the lower side of the probability to be returned. So it turns out that that shaded region is about 6.8% of the overall F distribution that I have plotted there. And you can see in that plot why I didn't want to attempt to do this one by hand, because I don't know what an F1016 looks like off the top of my head. So this is the p-value. Remember, my alpha level was 0.01. Um, so it was either 0.01 or 0.05. I can't remember. We'll see on the next slide. Either way, we would reject the null in that case. So yeah, I chose alpha equals 0.01. So just to review then, again, this slide then is completely review, nothing new here. The blue rejection region occurs at the quantile of an F1016 at the one percentile. And so that occurs, the rejection region begins at 0.22. Everything in the blue region to the left of that, we would reject. But my observed F statistic, the red dot, does not fall in the rejection region. And so we fail to reject the null. We again reach the same conclusion here with the rejection region as we did previously with the p-value. So those are p-values. That's We've computed them in three different ways. Um, I encourage you to watch this lecture a couple times then. Make sure you know this definition because this is one of the most important concepts in STAT 3202. You will see this throughout the rest of your statistical careers at Ohio State and the rest of your statistical careers wherever you end up when you end up in the workforce after this. It's a shame that we had to get quarantined before we talked about these because this really is an important topic and I really hope that everybody can actually understand what these are before moving on because you really need to know what these are. Questions, please email me. Please come to my virtual office hours and everything. Let me know and uh, thank you for your attention.